All right, well, uh, happy Wednesday afternoon. Thank y'all for being here with us. If you're live, you're watching by Facebook. We thank you for thank you for taking the time to watch uh, as we as we go through the book of Proverbs. Uh, by way of announcement, uh, we do have a uh, one announcement. We've updated the time of our bonfire for this Friday from from 6:30 to 7 p.m. Uh, so come out 7 p.m. I encourage you to bring a lounge chair if you uh, if you don't want to. Uh, sit on a metal chair bring uh, if you if you like me get you one that'll hold you up and uh, y'all come out eat a hot dog eat a s'more and uh, listen to some uh, worship music with us and just fellowship around around the campfire uh, let's go to the lord in prayer <clears throat> father god lord we come to you lord today in the name of jesus lord the name above all names lord we just thank you today for the for the reading and the hearing of your word, Lord. We thank you for allowing us to gather in your house, God, to, to study your word. Lord, we, we thank you for being able to record these messages, Lord, and be able, being able to, uh, to put them out there for other people, Lord, that, uh, that maybe, maybe those that are, that are at home and, and shut in and can't come, Lord, we, we thank you that we're able to still minister to them through, through the use of technology, Lord. Lord, we thank you for all that you do. Most of all, we thank you for sending your Son to die on the cross for our sins. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Well, tonight I'm going to do something uh, that I don't normally do, and I'm not going to go through the entire chapter. I normally uh, will run through the entire chapter as we're preaching, but, but tonight we're going to make it most of the way through Proverbs chapter 6, but we're going to be looking primarily at uh, Proverbs chapter 6, verses 1 through 23. So if you, if you would, let's, uh, let's stand and honor the reading of the Word of God. My son, if thou be surety for thy friend, if thou hast stricken thy hand with a stranger, thou art snared with the words of thy mouth. Thou art taken with the words of thy mouth. Do this now, my son, and deliver thyself when thou art come into the hand of thy friend. Go humble thyself and make sure thy friend. Give not sleep to thine eyes, nor slumber to thine eyelids. Deliver thyself as a roe from the hand of the hunter, and as a bird from the hand of the fowler. Go to the ant, thou sluggard. Consider her ways, and be wise, which, having no guide, overseer, or ruler, provideth her meat in the summer, and gathereth her food in the harvest. How long wilt thou sleep, O sluggard? When wilt thou arise out of thy sleep? Yet a little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to sleep, so shall thy poverty come as one that traveleth, 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 and thou wont as an armed man. A naughty person, a wicked man, while walketh with a froward mouth, he winketh with his eyes, he speaketh with his feet, he teacheth with his fingers. Frowardness is in his heart, he deviseth mischief continually, he, he soweth discord. Therefore shall his calamity come suddenly. Suddenly shall he be broken without remedy. These things that the Lord hate, yea, seven are an abomination unto him. A proud look, a lying tongue, and hands that shed innocent blood. A heart that deviseth wicked imaginations. Feet that be swift and, ruin, and running to mischief. A false witness that speaketh lies. And he that soweth discord among the brethren. My son, keep thy father's commandments, commandment, and forsake not the law of thy mother. Bind them continually upon thine heart, and tie them about thy neck. When thou goest, it shall lead thee. When thou sleepest, it shall keep thee. And when thou awakest, it shall talk with thee. For the commandment is a lamp, and the law is light. And reproofs of instruction are the way of life. Father God, Lord, we come to you, Lord, today in the name of Jesus, Lord, in the name of all names, God. And we just thank you, Lord the reading and the hearing of your word. Lord, we pray that we can, we can use what's taught in your word, Lord, to, to give us a, a better understanding of how we ought to live, Lord. And Lord, we pray that we will be submissive and obedient to your word, God. Uh, we know that you look out for us. You, we know that you have our best interest at heart, Lord. Lord, we pray that, that we'll have our own best interest at heart and obey your word, God. Lord, will we, give you all, will we carefully give you all the praise, all the honor, and all the glory. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. <clears throat> Humans are born with a, an incredible ability. And the biggest ability that a human is born with, we're born with this innate ability to mess things up. That's, 
that's our superpower. You, you know, you might, be good, you might be great at a lot of things, but we're born with the ability to just royally mess up. Um, I, I bet I've messed more things up in life than I've fixed. And it's, it, it is just it's incredible if you, if you ask a man to define himself. A lot of times a man will define himself more so based off of his failures than he will off of the things that he's actually achieved. He's, because we have this ability to mess up. Men have the ability to, to, to never think that they measure up, and it's because they know they have the ability to mess up. That's why I write in, uh, in pencil. I can't write, I can't write in ink because I've, I've got the ability to mess up and to mess up often. Humans are just born with it. Some things we mess up on purpose. Some things we mess up on accident. Some things we mess up with good intentions. You ever done something, tried to do something good for somebody and it wound up messing something up either for you or for them? It happens. We mess up things with procrastinating. We mess up things with our mouths. We mess up things with our disobedience. What I cannot find anywhere in the Bible is a time where someone has messed up something with their obedience, though. Disobedience, yes, but with their obedience, I can't find where someone's actually messed something up. I can find plenty of times where people didn't like what happened, but messed it up. If it was God's will and you were in God's will, that's not messed up there. Somebody might not like it, but what's messed up isn't what happened if it was in God's will. What's messed up is the opinion of what's happened. What's messed up is the, is the way people value Scripture and the way if someone wants to be obedient or not. Now, as a whole, people are disobedient. As a whole, church members are disobedient as well. But if we're obedient, to the Word of God, it's not a, it, it, there's no way to mess up here. Okay? Because if, if we were to mess up, it would, we would really be able to blame God because, hey, God, we were obedient and we messed up. But that's not the case. God knows what's best for us, and if we will obey His Word, we will not mess up. And if we'll take this passage of Scripture that we've got here today or any passage we'll ever read and, and obey what we're supposed to obey, and flee from what we're supposed to flee from, we can never go wrong. But that doesn't mean that obedience isn't hard. In fact, obedience might be quite possibly the hardest thing you'll ever do in your life. In Proverbs chapter 6, we're given instructions here on how to avoid some unnecessary difficulties in life. The first warning in Proverbs 6 shows us an example of one particular snare of entrapment that many of us have found ourselves in through good intentions. But if we look at the Word of God, we can, we can see a way out of this snare. Proverbs 6, verses 1 through 5 says, My son, if thou be surety for thy friend, if thou hast stricken thy hand with a stranger, thou art snared with the words of thy mouth. Thou art taken with the words of thy mouth. Do this now, my son, and deliver thyself. When thou art come into the hand of, of thy friend, go, humble thyself, and make sure thy friend. Give not sleep to thine eyes, nor slumber to thine eyelids. Deliver thyself as a roe from the hand of the hunter, and as a bird from the hand of the fowler. These five verses are straight to the point on what they're talking about here. So we're not going to spend much time on these particular five verses. In a nutshell, what they're telling you to do is not to cosign for an acquaintance, to put that in a in modern terms, there, you in in good intentions, you wouldn't want to if you were if you were sitting at the at the car dealer, and somebody in there couldn't get a loan, and you're in there and you overheard, oh, oh, they're having trouble getting a loan over there. It wouldn't make very much sense for you to say, well, I'll co-sign for him right now. I've never met this humdinger before in my life, but let me co-sign so he can get that loan on that on that uh, seventy thousand dollar pickup truck or or yeah, let, let me just sign my name for him. Let, let, me, let me go shake hands with the bank on his behalf. You know, I, I hate to break it to my kids, but I'm not going to co-sign for them, and at least not when they first start out on something. When, when I see that they'll be wise and pay their bills, and maybe then, but if somebody I don't know, I just can't do it. The Bible, the Bible tells us here not, not, to, not to go into these agreements with people, even people that you know. I'm going to tell you what. 
it comes down to uh, if you loan money out, you want a quick way to get rid of somebody, loan them some money. $10, you can get rid of somebody quick. You, you, never, you never have to see them again. That's it. $20, never see them again. I talked to a boy the other day at the ball game. He gave his cousin $300. And he, he said, hey, I don't care what you do with it. You pay me back whenever, whenever you're ready. <laughs> he did it to, because he knew he wasn't going to get paid. He knew this is the last time I got to loan money out. I've got, a, um, I've got some, some wise information from you here from the Word. You don't want to loan money out to strangers. And you certainly don't want to loan money out to family. If you can if you can get around, if there's another way. But in the event you do, you do sign for somebody, in the event you do shake hands, maybe, hopefully it's for someone you know well, if you don't know them well, especially if you don't know them well, and you've already entered into an agreement like that, the Word of God's clear, you need to be at that person, you, you, need, to, you need to be in front of them, you need to be finding out when they're making that payment, you need, you need to... You need to check on them, and you don't need to sleep until it's done because that is your debt. That is not their debt. That is, that is just as much yours as, as it is theirs. Excuse me. It'll behoove you to verify some things about that person if you were to do that. You're way better off not doing it, period. But if you did it, it will behoove you to verify some information on that person. It will behoove you to know where that person lived at. It will behoove you to have the second set of keys to that vehicle. It will behoove you to do those things so that you could, you could protect yourself. Otherwise, you're going to be you're ensnared, you're entrapped, and you're on the hook for this thing. I'm just using that car as an example because when we think of a cosigner, that's num the, one of the number one ways that you think of a, of a cosigner in America today. As a general rule, I do, not, um, I do not borrow money from people, and I do not loan out money to people either. This is, this is also something that the church does not do. Now, believe it or not, there are churches out there where you can go and borrow money from them, and they'll let you pay it back. This ain't one of them, not, not while I'm here. You're, we're not borrowing money from the church, and you, you would be surprised at how often that's the kind of phone call I get. I mean, it, it, happens, it happens all the time. People will, are saying, they'll call and they'll say, well, well, Pastor, I got this bill coming up. If I could, if I could just borrow uh, $300, if I could just borrow this, I'll, I'll put it back in the offering plate with interest. It just, it just happens that way all the time. And it's, most of the time when it happens, it's people that you've never heard of too. So what kind of sense would that make? If I was in the money loaning business, if I'm, using, if I'm being a good steward of God's money, what kind of sense would that make to loan out money to someone I've never met before? So this is, this is what, it, what it is here. It's not that you don't help people in those scenarios, but you don't loan out money. You don't create, one, if they're having a financial problem, why create another financial problem where they're going to have to pay back more money? That just doesn't make any sense. If you can help somebody and you're willing to do it and you think, and you think it's, hey, I need to help this person, then help them by all means. Give them the money. I, if, you come, if you come to me and need money, I'll, there's one of two options of getting it. Either I can find a job for you or I can give it to you. And there's no in between. And I'll tell somebody, hey, if I, if I give you money, this, this isn't a loan. You don't have to pay it back. And people go from, oh, I'll pay it back, to, oh, thank God I don't have to pay that money back real quick like. I, it happens all the time. But there's not very much time that does pass where someone isn't on the phone wanting to borrow money, sending messages on Facebook, wanting to borrow money. I, I'm sure even, even Tim, as a deacon of the church, has gotten the, gotten the phone call from time to time. Um, it, it just... It just happens. Um, we're in a season now where where these phone calls happen a little more often than what they than what they normally do. We're we're in the uh, the well. I'm gonna call it the holiday season because I'm not talking about specifically Christmas here. If I was talking about Christmas, I would say the Christmas season. But once once you get start getting close to Thanksgiving, people start calling more and more asking for money. Oh, preacher. 
We need money to, to buy a Thanksgiving meal. We need money to buy X, Y, and Z for my babies don't have Christmas presents. So Christmas snuck up on me. Thanksgiving snuck up on me. No, I happen to know for a fact they've got those dates planned out on the calendar well in advance for when Christmas and Thanksgiving. They didn't sneak up on you. Uh, birthdays don't sneak up on you. Uh, Nothing sneaks up on you like that. If, if it's set in stone, it's there, and you ought to prepare for it. But when it comes down to it, there are times to help people that need help. There, there's times that you can plan ahead, actually, even as a church. You can plan ahead, well, we're going to need to help this person or this person during, during this time period to, to help them out, especially if, you, if you're dealing with, uh, with families that, that you know they're in, they're in poverty and you know that, you know that they're doing... Uh, as, as good as someone can in that position. Help those people. Do, by all means, help them. Help widows. Help orphans. That's what, we're, that's what we're called to do. But these people, they will try to take advantage of your kindness. They'll try to, they'll try to um, demand certain things. I've had phone calls here where I have been cussed out because I've told people, no, I cannot help you with that. Um, I it's just, it's sad, but you know, when you, when you call me and you cuss me out because the church won't help you, that's a good sign that you didn't need my help to begin with. I, I just want to make that clear for anybody out there that does happen to call needing help. Cussing me out is probably not the way to get it. But when somebody does call and they need something, most of the time when they're seeking some kind of financial help, and they'll start with that whole, can you loan me the money process? I have to explain to them, no, I can't loan you the money. I can't, I can't get into this agreement with you. I can't, I'm not going to willingly make your situation worse. And before I give you money, uh, there's going to be a process before I can do that for, do that for you. If, you. if money would solve the problem, I'd be happy to give money to most about any scenario. But most of the time, uh, probably 99% of the time, money won't solve those problems. 99% of the time, there's an underlying issue, and you can uncover it. You can, you can figure out, well, maybe this person is wasting money. Maybe they're buying lottery tickets. Maybe they're buying alcohol. Maybe they're staying out uh, partying at the bar. Maybe, maybe they're, they're buying money for spending money on things they just ought not be spending them on. Maybe they're uh, wasting money. And so I do something. I, I say, well, before I loan you any money or before I give you any money, Let's, uh, let's sit down and let's look at your finances. Let's find out, hey, is this a scenario where we can help you one time? Because may maybe you're asking for $100, but you really need $500. And maybe we have to help you more than with what you're asking for. Or maybe it doesn't matter if I wrote you a check for, for $10,000, maybe next month you're in the same boat. And before I just give that money to you, we're gonna find out why. And you know what happens when you do that? When you tell somebody, hey, let me see exactly why you need the money, show me your bank statements, all of a sudden they don't need your money no more. Isn't that funny how that works? Like, you know how many financial crises I've solved for people by asking if I could see their bank statements? I mean, all of a sudden, I mean, they are filthy rich at that point. They don't need anybody's money. They don't need help from nobody. It is, it is amazing how that works. And if you just ask the question, the Bible, the Bible says... Yeah, it, it Bible, the Bible says for you to, to seek them out here. It says, um, I want to look specifically at the, at the, the words that it says here. It says, um, Do this now, my son. Deliver thyself when thou art come into the hand of thy friend. Go humble thyself and make sure thy friend. Make sure what you're giving this money to. Make sure it's a legitimate reason because you can... You can uh, well, you can find plenty of people that'll take your money. That's that's for sure. Um, and you know, it's one thing helping somebody, and I we want to help people, but we want to we want to help people that need help. We don't want to to be taken advantage of. And um, you know, some some people will tell you, well, you know, you preacher, you, you give them the money, and and what they do with it, you can't, you ain't got no control. Of. That's hogwash. No. <laughs> You find out where that money, what's going to happen with that money before you give it to them because it is your responsibility. It is your responsibility to be a good steward of God's money when you're in that position to do so. 
So it, it's not that we it's not that we just go out and and do whatever for for whoever, but the Lord will show you a lot of times, and and all you've got to do is ask the right questions, and the Lord will show you. There's groups in this area that really get taken advantage of. Um, the um, what, what's the place down here, Sandy? The Christian Services, Hope Christian Services, they get taken advantage of, and you know, good for them for helping as many people as they help. And they are a blessing to a lot of people. But there are people that their entire industry, their entire way of life is taking advantage of groups like Hope, groups like um, Christian services, and churches all around. Without fail, I could, I could write down a list with, with at least 10 names on it right now who will call the church or who will message me within the next two months. I could write them down right now, and you, you, might, you might think I was one of those uh, prophets to speak in, speak in what was going to happen, but this is what people do. Is they're, they're habitual, and you can, you can prevent things from, from taking place like that. But um, one thing I haven't figured out how to prevent yet is how to prevent from being cussed out when you, uh, when you really try to help someone, because they, they get pretty upset about it. They've said things to me they, like, some preacher you are, some church you are, won't help, the, won't help the needy, won't help the poor. You don't have to worry about me ever coming to that church and one infants me. I'm, I'll burn the place down. Oh, well, how about that? But needs, needs help. And then you follow that thing up with, brother, you do need help, but it's not financial. You, uh, you, need, you need Jesus Christ. Peter, Peter and Paul, they would, they'd have been great examples. They, and, and James, the, the other disciples, they would have been great examples. You know, sometimes it's not money that person needs. All the time it's the Word of God, though. One thing I've noticed about helping people is those who really need it rarely ask for it. And the ones who don't need it will demand it. It's a good idea to investigate before you give out money, so even, even if you're giving it away. Don't loan out money. You shouldn't. If you do, if you do loan out, you better be investigated. You, be, you better realize what you're signing your name to. Remember, when you sign that agreement, it's you that's on the hook. And it, and it is wiser to never get in such agreements. This is just an example of something you can get into with good intentions to help somebody. You're better, off, you're better off not getting there. If a man will put his nose to the grindstone, and if a man will work, he will not be dependent on another man. Proverbs chapter 6, verse 6 through 11, the Word of God says, Go to the ant, thou sluggard, consider her ways, and be wise, which having no guide, overseer, or ruler, provideth her meat in the summer, and gathereth her food in the harvest. How long wilt thou sleep, O sluggard? When wilt thou arise out of thy sleep? Yet a little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to sleep. So shall thy poverty come as one that traveleth, and, um, and, and one that traveleth, excuse me, and thy want as an armed man. The ants know that winter's coming. So they work to prepare, and they work to gather the food, and they work to gather the resources. And let me tell you something about humans. They know that bills are coming. They know that the mortgage is due at the first. They know that the rent is due on the first. They know that the light bill is coming. They know that the water bill is coming. People say, this bill snuck up on me. Well, that's a lie. It did not sneak up on you. They say, well, Christmas snuck up on me and we weren't prepared this year. No, Christmas didn't sneak up on you. You just didn't prepare this year. You got the last part right, but not the first part. This event snuck up on me. The truth is, nothing really snuck up on you if, it, if you were able to write it down on the calendar. You just didn't prepare. There are things that happen, though. There are, there are events. I, I, I mentioned one today about, it, about a family's car tour. That's an event that just takes place. That's something you can't help. There's people there who, who are uh, living, in, living in homes, elderly folks, and you know, no, no AC, no, no things that they need, no food. There's events that take place for people that cannot provide for themselves. Help those people. But I'm going to tell you what. 
I'm going to find it awful hard to help a 30-year-old able-bodied man uh, pay for an air conditioner unit for his house. Now, even, even if he's got kids there, I'm going to find it awful hard to help him. Now, that same 30-year-old man works, provides for himself, lightning runs in on that AC unit. You know, I got some sympathy there. I can, I can help you out with that. But when you put that thing in pond, when the, uh, when, the, when the winter come about, and here comes summer, and it's 90 degrees, 115 in the house, I don't know how much I can help you, brother. <clears throat> I see it every year. You know, the Operation Christmas Child and the, um, you know, the angel trees. I see families every year bragging about, oh, they're on this many trees. And I'm like, great day. And I've seen presents wind up in the pawn shop just as quick as they come in the house. You got, you know, you got to be careful who you're helping because people will take advantage. If the ant knows to prepare, people ought to know how to prepare. I'd hate to know that I'm not uh, not smarter than the ant. I, I would hate I would hate to know that. But I, I I believe we I believe we are. And you know how smart people are? They're smart enough to take advantage of other people. So not only do you have to be prepared and prepare. But you've got to be ready for when those try to take advantage of you too. You, but you've also got to be, you've got, you've got to have a good mix there. You've got to be willing to help where you can help at where, it, where it's needed. And if you'll, if you'll be in the Word, if you'll, if, you, if you'll use good discernment, the Lord will show you who to help. I guarantee it's not the same guy that's standing on the same corner for, for six weeks or six months. I guarantee it's not that guy. We're given another warning, though, about getting involved with strangers here in um, verses 12 through 15. A naughty person, a wicked man, walketh in a forward mouth. He winketh with his eyes, he speaketh with his feet, he teacheth with his fingers. Forwardness is in his heart, he deviseth mischief continually, he soweth discord. Therefore shall his calamity come suddenly, suddenly shall he be broken without remedy. Not every one who claims to preach the Word of God is doing what they claim that they're doing. Not everyone. Uh, the, here in verse 12 it says, a naughty person. We're not, we're not, talking, about a, uh, we're not talking about somebody that's naughty. They're, they're bad. But we use the word now. We're talking about a naughty person, an a, a, a empty person. We're talking about a, we're comparing a wheat and a tear here. We're talking about a person that's, that's empty on the inside. This, for, for those of us in the, born and raised in the South, now, Franz, did you ever watch the Beverly Hillbillies? Yeah, see, technically, that's a West Coast show because they were the Beverly Hillbillies, but Jethro on the show, he, when he would count, when he would count his zeros, he would say not. He would say, uh, when he was saying, he would, he would say uh, a 10 would be one not. And then he would refer to 007, the spy, as a, as a double not spy. It was, he would not not seven. That's what he would say. And you would hear him say, but that, that's the type of not that this is talking about. A nothingness, an emptiness. A naughty person, a wicked man walketh with a forward mouth. And there's people that are absolutely empty. No, no resemblance of the, of the Holy Spirit inside of them. No, no resemblance of, of Bible and what they're saying. But they're sitting there proclaiming to be men of God. And we tell you what, just like that one that doesn't have his, uh, doesn't have his ducks in a row, um, and just like that one that's, that's needing help with this bill or with that bill, guess what they do? They got their hand out wanting your money. They're just, they're just as bad as that one that won't provide for their family. They sit there and they'll preach a lie. They'll tell you a lie in order to get money. You've got to be careful of those people. These people teaching false doctrine, they're, they're empty men, they're wicked, and they sow discord in the churches. Verse 15 speaks of the calamity that will come upon these false prophets, and I believe this calamity is described further in Revelation 19.20. The Word of God says, And the beast was taken, and with him the false prophet that wrought miracles before him, which with, he, with, with which he deceived them that had received the mark of the beast and then that worshipped his image. Then both were cast alive into the lake of fire, burning with brimstone. This is what happens to the false prophet. And this, is what happened, this will be what happens to the many false prophet. This will be what happens to the many empty man that's standing there with his hand out, wanting you to give under a false pretense. 
Well, and, I mean, there, there's no difference. I want you to think about that than the prosperity gospel preacher and the bum standing on the corner for six months with his hand out holding the same sign. There's no difference. Receiving money under false pretenses. Both of them are liars. Both of them are deceivers. Now, living the crucified life, it's hard, but God gives us clear things that we ought to avoid. Proverbs 6, 12 through 19 says, These six things doth the Lord hate. That's a, that's a strong word there, doth the Lord hate. Yea, seven are an abomination unto him. A proud look, a lying tongue, and hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that, do, that deviseth wicked imaginations, feet that be swift in running to mischief, a false witness that speaketh lies, and he that soweth discord among brethren. There's a common phrase that I've heard quoted many times. I've even said it myself, so I've got to correct myself for, for saying a phrase here. I've heard many believers say it. I, I would imagine most everybody in this room, maybe besides the children, has said it. I would imagine most everybody watching by Facebook has used this phrase. And I want to tell you, we use it inappropriately. We ought to just strike it from our vocabulary as Christians. The phrase is, and when I, when I tell you what it is, it's going to go, well, I'll strike that one from your vocabulary. And it's, I'm going to show you why, what the Word of God says about it. The phrase I've heard so many people say, I guarantee I can scroll through Facebook and see somebody posting it right now. That's how common this one is. Love the sinner, hate the sin. We need to remove that from our vocabulary as Christians. And I'm going to show you why. I'm going to show you what the Word of God says about this. God actually gives some pretty, he, he some pretty specific words on what He actually hates. Four of the things that God mentions here are the physical parts of the sinner, not what the sinner does. It is the actual physical parts of the sinner. A lying tongue. This is something God hates. It's not the fact that it's not just talking about the lie itself. A lying tongue, that is part of the sinner. Hands that shed innocent blood. The last time I saw, hands were part of people. A heart that deviseth wicked imaginations. It's not just the wicked imaginations. It's not just the shedding of the innocent blood. It's not just the lie. It is the tongue itself. It is the hands themselves. It is the heart itself. And also feet that are swift and running to mischief. It's not just the mischief that was run to. It is literally the tongue, hands, heart, and feet of a person. So when we say love the sinner, hate the sin, you know, the reason people say that <clears throat> is not because that's what God does. God literally hates sin, and God literally hates sinners. The difference is how God does that versus how we do it. We do not have the capability, because we're not God, to hate somebody without malice. God can hate without malice. God is holy. He can do something we can't do. He can... He can do this, do this thing, and still love them, and still send His Son for them, even though He literally hates what they do, and hates them specifically for doing it. Now, this is this is not this is not me saying this is this is what the Word of God says here. He's talking about the physical things that He hates. And humans, we are physical bodies. And I'm gonna tell you, I do believe that's why these old physical bodies get left here. I do believe that's why we need a, 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 a new body. I do believe that's why we need a glorified body because this body is, is, is worthy to be hated. If that doesn't spell out hate in the center, then I don't know what exactly does. But God has this unique attribute. He's able to unconditionally hate without malice. That's it in the attribute of man. God's still willing to forgive the sinner. And God doesn't, he doesn't give us permission to actually hate anyone because we can't do it without malice. We can't do it and remain holy, but God can. God has called us to witness to these people, even though they be sinners. Because I'm going to tell you what, there's not one in here 
that even though that you're saved, that your physical body is still caught up in sin on some level. The spirit inside of you doesn't sin, but that old nature, that old you, that old Franz, that old Franz is still a sinner. That new, that new Franz, the one that's got child, that's a child of God. You got a new name. That one, that one is, he's holy, he's good, but he's still attached to that old flesh, Franz. Same thing, same thing with with Robert. Same thing with, same thing with me. I'm, I'm, I've got part of me. I've got the spirit of God that dwells inside of me, and the spirit of God doesn't sin. But I'm gonna tell you what, this flesh will sin. And it'll, it'll do it often. And God hates that. God even, even hates that about me. That I still have the, the capacity to sin. And thank God He doesn't let this, this old corrupt body go into heaven because either it, if, it, if it went, it would just taint what was up there because it's just no good. It's filthy. It's no good. God's still willing to forgive sinners though. And He still gives us the, the command to witness to those people and to share the gospel with them. That doesn't mean that we sugarcoat the Word of God until they like us, though. We're to tell them the truth of the gospel. And In fact, if we don't tell them the truth of the gospel, that means we're the one with the lying tongue. We're the one that, that God hates at that point. And the lying tongue is hated so much by God that He mentions it twice, once in verse 17 and once in verse 19, he says, A proud look, a lying tongue, and hands that shed innocent blood. Verse 19 says, A false witness that speaketh lies, and he that soweth discord among brethren. Both of those verses cover a lying tongue. So God must really hate that. I feel sorry for those that are out there that are pro-murder. I'm not talking about being pro-choice, I'm talking about being pro-murder, because that's what it is. I feel sorry for those people because they check all six boxes of what God actually hates. And I say it with the utmost sincerity, I pray for those people to come to Jesus Christ for salvation. Nobody will be happier than when those pro-murder people come to Jesus Christ than I am. Nobody, no, n nothing will be louder than the, the shout in heaven when a pro-murder person comes to salvation in Jesus Christ. But not only does God tell us what to flee, He also tells us what to cling to. And we'll close quickly. Verses, uh, Proverbs 6, verses 20 through 23. <clears throat> My son, keep thy father's commandment, and forsake not the law of thy mother. Bind them continually upon thine heart, and tie them about thy neck. When thou goest, it shall lead thee. When thou sleepest, it shall keep thee. And when thou awakest, it shall talk with thee. For the commandment is a lamp, and the law is light, and reproofs of instruction are the way of life. Now, we talked a couple of weeks ago about sin being like a, like a, a cord or a strand of rope, and every time it wraps around something, I gave you, I, it makes, it's harder to break. I gave you the example of the, the little plastic rings on the, on the cans of Diet Pepsi. You fold them up on the little six-pack cans. You fold them up, and you can pull one easy, and you can break it. But if you fold it, it gets a little harder to break, and a little harder to break. Sin is like that. It keeps wrapping one cord after another, and there's nothing you can do. You can't you can't break it under your own power. And it takes the it takes the power of God to to get you out of sin. It takes the the power of God. It takes the blood of Jesus Christ to pay for any sin, even one sin, but to get away from it. It takes the power of God. And I'm, I'm, I want to talk to you about, about guarding your heart here. Just the same way that one little strand of sin mixed with another little strand and another little strand, and it gets harder to escape from. If we flip that around and we start looking at the righteousness of God, we start looking at the things that we can immerse ourselves with, if you start replacing things in your life, you start replacing sinful things with things of God. Uh, to, today somebody was telling me about replacing... Uh, some rock and roll with some gospel music, with some hymns. You replace them just a little bit. You replace one, you replace two, you replace three. You do that. You, you hang up those Bible verses in the house that we were talking about on Sunday. You, you do what Peter was talking about in, in what we're talking about in Second Peter and putting things to remembrance. You do that. And instead of having a strong cord of sin, you now you have a, a strong cord 
of the things of God, it'll become harder to break. You'll be immersed yourself. You'll flee from what's wicked. You'll cling to what God calls good. And that, that's the absolute definition of guarding your heart, but not guarding your heart from, from the things, from, from just other people but guarding your heart from sin. Guard, guarding, guarding your heart, keeping, keeping something that's precious to God, safe and secure. And you do that with His Word. You do that with immersing yourself in the Word. You do that with, you, you, you do that with, with getting the Word of God in front of you, getting in front of your children as often as possible. Proverbs chapter 4 and 23, the Word of God says this, Keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. If we would just give over those parts of our life and be obedient to the Word of God where we know to be obedient, then the Word of God will help us keep and protect our heart. It'll, it'll keep us from falling, so to speak. But I, I pray that this has been able to, to help you today. This has been a, just a lesson on, on obedience, a lesson on just a, a principle of of how to help people, when to help people. I, I pray that this be of, of some help to you. And I promise you that it will be if you look at God's Word and you obey what's in God's Word. Father God, Lord, we come to you, Lord, today in the name of Jesus, Lord, the name above all names, Lord. Lord, we thank you today for the reading and the hearing of your Word. Lord, we thank you today, Lord, for the principles that you've put and had outlined for us in black, white, and red right between the leather, Lord. Lord, we thank you so much for the ease of access we have to your Word, God. Lord, if we would just read it, Lord, and we would just obey it, God, we would be so much better off, Lord. Lord, for those out there that don't read and obey Your Word, Lord, I, Lord, I pray that they'll they'll have a, a hunger for it, Lord. Because I, Lord, there, I know there are those that are Christians out there that do not read Your Word and, and are not obedient, Lord. Lord, just pr pray for a double dose of conviction for those people, Lord, and draw them draw them back near to You, Lord. And Lord, we thank You for their salvation, Lord, but we we pray for their conviction so that they can use that salvation and use the testimony that you've given them, God, to win others to you, Lord, to draw, to, to grow your kingdom. And Lord, we'll be forever grateful, Lord, for you doing what only you can do, God. Lord, we thank you so much for all that you do. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.